All right, this video is going to be talking about the anterior spinal cerebellar, uh, the pathway that that tract takes into the cerebellum, and what happens there. We talked about this at the end of lecture, page 113. Uh, the little assignment that Torgerud gave us was talking about um, how we might be able to influence the extensor musculature um, of the right thigh and, how, and the pathway that might possibly happen. When he first went through that, I was a little confused as to why he chose the path he did, but we'll talk about why that path makes sense. So first, we're going to be dealing with the anterior spinal cerebellar tract, which we talked about in one of the other videos. It deals with gross movement that's about to happen, so about to occur. So let's start by drawing it out. We'll call this it here. Starts down in the spinal cord and as it comes up, remember it goes up through the superior cerebellar peduncle, which we'll draw right there. It's the little doorway that it goes into. Remember the if we were to have a brain and spinal cord here, the anterior comes in this side, little synapse crosses over, comes up, and makes a number four right there. This is where that peduncle is right there. So from the peduncle, it's got three options. It can either go to spinal cerebellum, portion of the cerebellum, vestibulo, or cerebro. Remember the spinal cerebellum based on the chart. Let me make sure I get the right page this time. The chart on page 107 tells us that the spinal cerebellum gets input from the anterior, the posterior cere spinal cerebellum, and the cuneo. So we know it's going to come up here. And remember the two fibers entering the cerebellum are either mossy or climbing. So we need to classify this as either mossy or climbing. Um, it's easy to do because the climbing fibers are always going to start in the inferior olive. Anything not originating in the inferior olive is going to be a mossy fiber. So the anterior spinal cerebellum is mossy. Mossy fibers, again, we'll draw our little three layers. We'll zoom into this portion here. Three layers. Let's make this a different color. Remember we have the molecular layer. Get rid of that. We had the Purkinje layer. And we have the granular layer. Any mossy fiber is going to first synapse in the granular layer. And we know that because granule sounds like grain, which is always found in the ground, just like moss, which is always on the ground. So we have the mossy fiber coming in, stopping there. We have a different color for the granular neuron or granular cell comes up and makes its way to the top in the molecular layer. From there it's going to synapse on a Purkinje fiber and we remember that the Purkinje fiber there's two different kinds we have a spine and we have a smooth. This is going to be a spine Purkinje coming synapsing with the granular cell. We know that because spine Purkinje's, I think of them just like a little grain of of uh, wheat or something like that at the ends. It's got two little spines, therefore spine Purkinje. So we got spine Purkinje. But it needs to use a chemical. What chemical is it going to use right here? It's going to use glutamate as its chemical. We'll get to why it's not aspartate in the next video. Glutamate is the neurotransmitter that it uses to create that signal. It has an excitatory effect on that Purkinje fiber. Um, from this point on, it's identical um, to the posterior spinal cerebellar and the cuneo cerebellar. So let's just draw our little cells here coming up. Then we have, let's make our spine Purkinje's green starting in the molecular layer it's going to continue because it's got to go somewhere that spine Purkinje has to do something so from this outer layer it's going to continue remember anything from the spinal cerebellum is going to go let me check the pages here it's going to go to one of three 
it's going to go either to the fistigial and one of the two interposed nucleus, the globose and the emboliform. And we know that from page 113, top of the page, talks about where these Purkinje fibers will go from the spinal cerebellum. Now once it gets to here, the spine Purkinje, it uses a different neurotransmitter. We're going to draw that here in pink. And that is the neurotransmitter GABA. GABA has an inhibitory inhibitory effect on one of those three. Now when it gets there, we're going to have to grab another color here. Once it gets there, then these three nuclei here, one, two, three, they all have three options. Also on page 113, you'll see that the fastigial, which is the smallest one here, leaves via the inferior peduncle, and it goes either to the vestibular nucle nucleus, it goes either to the nuclei of cranial nerves 3, 4, or 6, and it also sends them up to the reticular formation, right up here. So the vestigial nucleus can send to one of those three places. The globose and the emboliform, they essentially count as one. They are called the interposed. So we have globose, emboliform, and they collectively are the interposed. Um, from there, they've got a few options, but either way, they go out through the superior uh, cerebellar peduncle. They go to either the red nucleus or the reticular formation. Uh, not hard to remember all of these if you can just picture this diagram. From the superior, they're just going to the next, to the two closest ones, right there, reticular and red. So the reticular cells, reticular formation is actually um, where it says they go, but reticular cell, um, I'm not 100% sure if that's the cell that they go to, if that's counting. Um, and that's the whole pathway. Now in the notes at the at the bottom of uh, page 113 he was saying how can we get information to the extensor musculature to slow down and stop being so activated. Um, he chose the vestigial nucleus and I was like well why didn't he choose let me get yellow here why didn't he choose the vestibular cerebellum? The vestibular cerebellum we know sends information down here through the inferior peduncle and it goes to the vestibular nucleus. So I was like, well, that makes the most sense. That one clearly goes there. Why don't we use the vestibular cerebellum to send information to the vestibular nucleus, which is the origin for the vestibular spinal tract that could tell them the extensor musculature to slow down. Why didn't we use that one? Because we have no way of getting that information as far as we know. We have no way of getting the information from the extensor musculature to the vestibular cerebellum. The vestibular spinal tract starts here in the vestibular, nu vestibular nucleus and it goes down. Remember it's ipsilateral. It is descending. So there is no sensory function of it. I don't write it out. There's no sensory function of the vestibular spinal tract. So even though it, in theory, we need to get information from the vestibular cere or to the vestibular cerebellum from the vestibular nucleus, because if you go to our little chart on page 107, you will see the vestibular cerebellum gets input from the vestibular nucleus. But we have no way of getting that information from the muscles to the vestibular nucleus. That's why that's why we chose to take the anterior spinal cerebellum. That will take information from those muscles to the spinal cerebellum. From the spinal cerebellum we have the option of going to the interposed or the vestigial. The vestigial happens to be the one that can send information to the vestibular nucleus which happens to be where we can slow down that activity 
to the extensor muscles. I couldn't quite figure out at first why he chose the path he did because it seemed to make more sense to go from there to start in the vestibular nucleus, but then you realize there's no way for sensory information to get to the vestibular, to get to the vestibulo cerebellum, which is why we had to have information go to the spinal cerebellum and then down. Hope that made a little bit of sense. I think that covers about everything. Next video will be on the vestibulo cerebellum and the path that it takes. Nope, that's a lie. I'm not sure what we'll do next. Hope that helps.